So just to sort of wrap up and, and kind of tell you where I think all of this is going, uh, we can actually learn a lot from whole genome sequencing of, of cancer samples, but we also can now start to plug this into the clinic, uh, especially for these atypical cancers. So if you'll recall back uh, earlier, we were talking about genes, uh, the genes BRCA1 and BRCA2 being involved in breast cancer, right, and the gene EGFR being involved in some types of lung cancer. Well, those are sort of the typical cases, and if you find mutations in those genes, you kind of understand the disease. But there are a lot of uh, cases of lung cancer or breast cancer that we don't have that sort of finding. And so now we kind of have this new genomic approach and tools uh, to start to understand what's going on in these weird cancer cases and actually do something about it. Uh, you have to go through all kinds of um, red tape to be able to do this. Patients have to give their consent. Um, quite often patients that have cancer, when you ask them, we want, we want you to sign, uh, we'd like you to provide some of your samples for, for DNA research. Um, you know, we'll protect your identity, we'll protect uh, all of your um, private information. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, and at some point, it may not, maybe not for your case, but for uh, other people in future years who have this type of cancer, it's going to help. And so it's now possible we figured out how to do this. Um, it does take a village. So I probably made it seem pretty easy that, you know, we've gone from taking 10 years and a millions of dollars to sequence a human genome to being able to do it in a few weeks um, for a few thousand dollars. Uh, the sequencing part of it is actually pretty straightforward, although there's not a lot of places still in the world that can do it. But what really is the hard part is to take all that data and make sense out of it and then to interpret it with the help of oncologists uh, so we can say, we understand, not, we not only understand what went wrong in your genome to cause this disease, but we also have a really good clue as to how to treat it. Uh, and this is going to go on and on. So uh, as I've said, we've sequenced lots and lots now of AMLs, and this graph just shows you, this is about 52 uh, patients who we've sequenced. Each of these bars indicates how much sequence we generated for, in red, their tumor genome, and in yellow, their um, uh, normal genome and all the color boxes down here show you that we've looked at all these different subtypes uh, of AML. We found a, a whole bunch of other very important and interesting mutations. This is just one. This is sort of a representation of a protein encoded by a gene called DNMT3A. And all of the lines and colored balls up here show you the locations of mutations that we found uh, in this particular gene. This turns out to be a real killer in leukemia. Um, we found out that this gene is mutated in 22 percent of all patients with leukemia. And in those cytogenetically normal patients that we really want to try to get more genetic clues to, uh, it's present in uh, 34 percent uh, of those patients. This just shows you the survival curve. Uh, the red line here are patients who have AML but do not have a mutation in that gene, DNMT3A. These are the patients that have AML and do have a mutation in their DNMT3A mutation, and you can see that their, uh, the uh, percent of those patients who survive uh, and the length of their average length of survival is much worse uh, than uh, AML patients without the disease. You can see that there still are some survivors, uh, and basically there are some patients that have these mutations uh, that uh, do not survive very long and others that seem to uh, do a little better. So we want to understand all of the different mutations, all of the different things that might be going on. And we're starting to be able to build, remember when I was saying this was a horrible graph, this is why it projects terribly. But uh, what you can't see here is uh, all of these different chromosomal events and now mutations in genes like DNMT3A and other genes called FLT3, IDH1 and 2, and NPM1, <clears throat> the colored boxes that you're supposed to be see, seeing here basically allows us to say a patient with DNMT3A mutation does very poorly, unless he has also a mutation in his FLT3 gene. For some reason, they are not as poor prognosis as if they just have a DNMT3A mutation. And so we're starting to try to build this combinatorial matrix of a hit in this gene is terrible. If it also has a mutation in that gene, it's not so bad. If there's a mutation in these three genes, it's really awful, sort of that. So, you know, based on all of that kind of information, 
we eventually can build sort of a lookup table, right, of genes and mutations that can give some very strong clues back to the, the physician who has to treat these patients. So uh, I will stop by just showing you names of uh, the people that have been doing this work. Um, a lot of folks over at the Genome Center, including uh, uh, Dr. Lee Ding and Dr. Elaine Martis, who have done a lot of the work on this, and then our colleagues uh, at the Seidman Cancer Center. This is the um, hematological malignancies group, which is led by Tim Lay, Peter Westervelt. He was the treating physician uh, of that, that AML case I told you about uh, with the weird fusion gene, and John DePerzio, who is the head of the division of uh, uh, oncology. And, and a big thanks go out to the patients who have uh, agreed to participate in these studies. So I'd be happy to take a couple questions, and thanks for your attention. Yes, sir. You were the only person in the room with your finger. I ah. um, Told you, it's the martial arts training. Thank you very much, Rick. So I, I, I can't allow some questions. The first one is, who goes for the genome sequencing? Like, you talked about 40K, which is the present cost of, um, uh, of doing the sequencing. So if I have 40K, can I just come to the center to do the sequencing? Um, for most of the sequencing that we've done, it's been your tax dollars at work. There have also been some um, private gifts from wealthy people, not people who want their genome sequenced, but people who basically said, I think what you guys are doing is important and I want to basically um, help fund that. Um, it, it's a great question, right? You, if you've got a spare 40K in your bank account and you have cancer, or you just want your genome sequence, can you just come in and get your genome sequence? It's, um, it's something that we worry about, right? So you don't want to end up in a situation where all the rich people can get their genome sequence because they have a particular disease, right? And, you know, let's say I agree, you're, you're obviously a wealthy man now, you've got 40,000 bucks to spend. So you come in and say, I've got 40K, I want to get my say, okay, we'll do it, right? And then the lady sitting next to you in the pink sweater is like, hey, I've got 50K and I want to be done before him because I'm really worried about my own health situation. So she buys her way to the front of the line. I can see that sort of thing happening. I'm not suggesting that it's fair, but you might. Uh, but it, we worry about that, right? And, you know, you instantly get into sort of this disparity in who has access to the so it's, it's, it's a little bit of a quandary. Um, we're trying to figure out some things like this because we already do have people coming to us and saying, I have cancer, the guys can't figure out what to do, I want to have my genome sequence, how to do it. We've actually taken on some cases like that, but we basically use our own discretionary funds to people. So we're still trying to understand that. Yes, ma'am. So um, how soon do you think this will be available? Like how soon will you have enough people to practice? It's a great question. So some of the stuff can move pretty quickly into clinical practice. So um, as a result of sequencing the young woman who had the uh, atypical um, M3 AML, <clears throat> the cytogeneticist now has new probes that we supply them with on the basis of our finding that the next time uh, they have a situation where the pathologist says, I'm seeing granular sites, I bet it's M3, and the cytogeneticist says, yeah, but I don't see any translocation, the cytogeneticist can then use those probes and look for that fusion gene and say, there's no translocation, but there's a fusion gene treatment back. Right? So that kind of thing can move into the um, clinical sequencing lab pretty quickly. If it's something that has to be based on the whole genome, that's what we're trying to find. We're actually uh, in the process of writing a grant that we're going to submit in a couple of weeks that not only involves um, you know, genomics experts from the Genome Center, but also uh, folks from the medical school and then folks from uh, uh, various departments around the university and the medical school who think about the ethics and uh, consent issues and human subjects issues to think about not only how do we move that into the, the clinical, you know, diagnostic lab, but how also do we worry about who pays for it, how do they get access to that and so forth. So 
to be answered. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, how different is insertion from translocation? I kind of didn't get the difference. Uh, so uh, this is chromosome 15, this is chromosome 17. What happens is, is that you have sort of a crossing over, and now imagine um, my two hands going off as a new chromosome and the rest of my arms going off as another chromosome. Mm -hmm. So there's essentially an exchange of maybe half to a small part of the chromosome. The insertion is uh, simply imagine uh, my hand, my wrist breaking off and popping in over here. So now I've got an extra wrist and my hand stuck to an arm. Sorry if that was too grass. <laughs> <laughs>